Right. Um, you'll be relieved to hear, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to give you a lengthy speech or a harangue. Um, what I am going to do, though, is to ask you to think over the next few minutes of one aspect of your... Okay, I want, I want you all to think, because I'm going to ask people at random in a moment. I want you all to think of one thing in your own culture which you would like to see developed more here or introduced here, indeed, if it's non-existent, and one thing in the culture you find here which you find either offensive or otiose or unnecessary which you'd like to actually see done away with altogether. So two things, one a positive, one what you would like to see imported here, and secondly, uh, the thing that actually annoys you. And I'll give you a very trite example. And I know my Bengali friends won't mind me saying this, um, because I have very many Bengali friends going back um, several decades now when I first opened an office in Silet in northern Bangladesh. But um, you know, colonialism was an unfortunate episode in global history. It was done for exploitation and indeed with some degree of rapacity and stealing of natural resources. But uh, there was a reciprocation. There, there were some good things that emanated from uh, that colonial era, even though they were not necessarily planned, but they were uh, a, a coincidence of, of that. Um, one thing I've always thought that the British had, which was uh, a good idea, was that when we have dinners and speeches, we always have the speeches after the dinner. So you actually can enjoy the dinner. Now, my Bengali friends, are the Bengalis in the room here? Uh, yes. Um, will know that this is not what was adopted in Bangladesh, notwithstanding British, British rule. And in fact, there you have all the speeches before the dinner, and I have been at some uh, dinners where, quite literally, it's 10 o'clock in the evening until all the speeches are over and you first get the sniff of, of food. Now, that's a trite example, but <laughs> it's one where I think um, we, might, we might be a little more sensitive towards one another on those things. I just wanted to say a few words about uh, multiculturalism, uh, and I still use the word. I know it's become unpopular. Uh, because, not least, it's uh, interpreted in so many different ways. For me, it is the coexistence and the osmosis of cultures together. So, actually, people are learning cultural things, not just in terms of the arts and music that we've heard about already, but also in terms of cuisine, and just look at uh, the way in this country, I mean, frankly, uh, British cuisine, indigenous cuisine, is something that most people would like to do without. Uh, it's, uh, it's not actually had a very good history. But now, you come to London, and it is so multicultural in terms of its cuisine, you can have any kind of food that you like from all over the world, and that's fantastic. But you see, London, we're extraordinarily privileged here, and we, I think, sometimes are unaware of the fact that because we live in one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world where 300 languages are spoken, where you can get on a bus and you can see people from all over the world uh, sitting on the bus and speaking their own language. We tend to think that this is something that is more widespread. And of course it's not. Even in capital cities where one might argue they are international cities. Let me take Brussels, for example. I'm sure many of you are very well aware of Brussels. Um, it's multicultural in terms of the fact that you've got so many civil servants from very many different countries um, actually in Brussels uh, as um, participating in the European Union institutions or whatever. And yet, um, at 9 o'clock at night, Brussels closes down. It's like a provincial town, uh, whereas London, you can go out at three o'clock in the morning, and it's almost like the mid-afternoon in terms of the traffic still driving around. So we, we are privileged, but also 
we are in danger, I think, uh, in London, of very often making assumptions that what we have here, and there are tensions as well, but generally you have this wonderful coexistence of so many different cultures, religions, uh, and, and, and backgrounds, ethnicities, all living juxtaposed with one another, uh, that this is not the sort of thing that exists elsewhere. And I think, therefore, we have a particular responsibility here to try to promote multiculturalism in the way I would describe it, as being different cultures, not the melting pot, not all being sub subliminal to uh, one sort of overarching culture, which is just an admixture of them all, but those cultures being able to survive in their own purity and what they have to bring, but nevertheless learning from each other and actually transferring uh, those, those messages uh, across. Uh, when Gosia was talking about bloody foreigners, I was uh, reminded of uh, a book that I'm sure many of you would have read, but if not, I can heartily recommend it, called Bloody Foreigners. It's by Robert Winder. It's quite a thick book, but it is the history of migration into this country, way back from time immemorial. And it's written very sensitively, uh, not in an anti-immigrant, but a pro-migrant uh, vein. And it really does demonstrate how this country, and I think it's true of any country, has so greatly benefited from migration. And we are now living in an age where people know what is going on in the far side of the world more than they know what's going on in their neighbor's house, quite literally the case in, in, in many circumstances. Because we have the internet, we have the television, we have radio, we have all sorts of means of communication. Also, historically, the cost of travel now, relatively, is so much cheaper than it has been for a very long time. So we shouldn't really get too exercised about the fact that many people use that opportunity to travel, either in search of work or because they just want to see other parts of the country or whatever. Uh, our elder daughter, she's 23, is just about to go next month with her boyfriend to South America for four months. I just had to sort out the insurance. It's horrendous uh, for, for that length of, uh, of stay. But she will come back, no doubt, as I came back from when I was a student and I put my thumb up and I, well, I took a train to Istanbul and then I um, put my thumb up and uh, hitchhiked uh, until I found myself in Singapore six months later, having gone to all the intervening countries in those days you could. Uh, there was, there wasn't, wasn't the divisions or the trouble that we now see in many of those, those countries in between. And I always maintain that I, uh, I went out um, a parochial Englishman and I came back a world citizen. So I think you know, there is an enormous amount that we can all learn from each other, particularly where we don't have to do that travelling because we are juxtaposed. So that's all I, really I wanted to say before I'm now going to very cruelly and arbitrarily pick on one or two of you to ask you the answers to those questions that I posed about, if I may remind you, one thing that from your own culture uh, that you would like to see, and if it's this culture, that's fine, one thing you would like to see more exposed, uh, and one thing that actually you find here that really is an inhibition to that cultural mismatch, that, that, that sort of that cohesion of society that we were talking about earlier. So, sir, let me ask you, first of all, one thing from your culture which uh, you think you would like to see more of here, or indeed introduce here if it doesn't exist? Yes. 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 It's a very interesting point. I'm not going to try attempt to answer it because, of course, you come from a country where, unfortunately, it's very polarised between the Christian South and the, the um, Islamic North. Um, and I appreciate the, the enormous uh, pressures that are there. It, it's a very, very difficult question which would take me a long time to answer. Um, in the interest of gender, gender balance, I'm going to pick on you, Jenna. Okay. Uh, Jenna, Jen, Jenna has a, a, a varied background of, of both, um, well, by association uh, Bengali, but, but particularly Iranian. Uh, so, Jenna, what is the, what from either of those cultures would you like to see more of here introduced, and what here do you really find very bad that you'd like to see done away with? Uh, well, actually, I am originally Iranian. I'm born in the European family, so it's a more 
<laughs> it's a very, very good point, and, and one I have to say I share passionately. I think the, the, the fact that you know, in this country, it seems to be the tradition, young people leave home very early, uh, there isn't the same care, even you know, in, in Germany, I mean, you used to have the classic example of the granny flat, where granny used to live underneath the, the parents of the children, looked after the children when the parents were out, and such like much more cohesive family unit than we seem to have achieved here. So it's a very good point to it. All right, one more, and then, then, then I'm, that, that, that's right, then I'm off, yeah. Actually, it's on the Right, thank you, yes. 